ask him to come in. Ask him to come in. We'll sing, come. Come, like you promised. Come, fall upon us. Come, like you promised. Come, fall upon us. Sing that again.
Hold on. 
And Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. We're going to continue in an attitude of worship this morning, but consider the name Jesus. Back, just say that name out loud. Jesus. Paul says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. But this idea that every knee bows, understand this one because we're about to move into a, a time of prayer. But every knee bows at the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is his authority. It's his power. He says, I'm sending you out in my name. In my name, you will ask, and it shall be done. The power of the name of Jesus, that every knee bows. That means that every demonic influence that is aimed toward you, be it in the form of sickness, disease, fear, anxiety, hopelessness, doubt that the enemy would bring, poverty, whatever the enemy has said against you, and you understand you have victory and authority in Christ, and that authority comes in the name, the name that he has given you permission to carry the name of Jesus, and it bows. That sickness, that disease, that, that fear, that doubt, that conflict, that, that anxious heart, that anxious mind, it, those things bow. The Word of God says that demons know the name of Jesus and they shudder. What's the most, when you're, when you're, remember when you were in middle school, at least guys, ladies, I'm sure you got it, you ladies didn't fight in middle school, but in middle school, everybody's got to earn the right, right? You got you to gotta stake your territory, and you got to get to the top of the pecking order pretty quick in gym class, right? And so you, you kind of you toughen up a little bit, and you, you, you try to intimidate. And you try to come across bold and, 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 and with some sense of power. You try to intimidate the other person. You talk big. You talk loud. You get all up in their face until they get back in yours, and then you figure out maybe he is the top of the pecking order. But you try to put fear in the opponent. You ever watch those uh, mixed martial art guys when they're weighing in before their bouts, and they stand there, and they just stare at each other? The idea is to try to, try to put some, get something of fear lodged in that person's mind. Because when you tremble, you can't stand your ground very well. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. So whatever the enemy brings against you, you have the authority of the name of Jesus. And maybe it's just as simple as when you're feeling anxious, just saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I heard Jesse Duplantis one time say he was in an airplane flying in, commercial flight, and they were flying in, landing, and they hit ice, and they started sliding toward the, toward the terminal, and the, boat, uh, the, the, the plane is just kind of sliding. They're getting closer and closer. He said, I prayed, and I said, help us, Jesus, help us, Jesus, help us, Jesus. He said, it was the most theological prayer I'd ever prayed in my life. I knew what we needed. I knew who could do it, and I was calling out to him. Help us, Jesus. When you've got the name of Jesus... So we're going to continue to worship the Lord this morning, but I believe that uh, as we do every week, now is the moment and the time for us to have prayer. So this morning, I'm going to invite you, you, you desire the Lord to do something in, in you today. You need the Lord to intervene in the situation. You, uh, you've got the doctors, but you know doctors are, are not that good without God on their side. No offense to doctors, but it's God who gives us that wisdom and all of that. So but whatever your need is, spirit, soul, or body, I want to invite you to come and just join me right here at this altar. 
one of the prayer partners will come and they'll anoint you with oil according to James chapter 5. James says, is any of you sick? You should call the elders of the church there to anoint you with oil. That oil is a reminder of the anointing of the Spirit of Christ who he said himself has come to bind up the brokenhearted, to heal the sick, and to set captives free. He said, that's the anointing that's been placed upon me. So I invite you to go ahead and come. Find you a place right here at this altar. These prayer partners will step to you. And maybe you're here this morning, you don't desire prayer, but I invite you in these next few moments, don't concern yourself with what's at the altar and happening here. You press into the presence of the Lord this morning. You, you and your worship, create this atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to come and, and do what he does. We just sang it a while ago. You inhabit the praises of your people, Lord. But if you desire prayer, this is the place and this is, this is the moment. You say, I've prayed about it 50 times. Let's make it 51. Who knows at what point God pulls that trigger, flips that switch and says, now is that moment. Now is where you are that I can do that for you. But come and let's pray together this morning and let's worship the Lord. We want to come and prepare to give our hearts. Because He is enthroned over us. Yeah. 
praises. just from your own heart right now in this moment of stillness, just express your worship. You don't know where to start? Start with this. Just tell God who He is to you this morning. Who is the Lord to you today? Tell Him what you're grateful for that you know has come from Him. Tell Him what you are grateful for that He's doing in your life today. 
Give him some praise, church. Give him some worship, not scripted by song, but just a song from your own heart, a new song, a spiritual song, as the Apostle Paul would call it. Let it be a worship that touches the heart of your Father this morning. He's worthy of your worship. He's worthy to hear you acknowledge his place in your life. He's worthy to have his name in your life lifted above all. Lord, we worship you and we do exalt your name above every name. You, O oh God, are the God of heaven. You are the God of earth. You are the God of our hearts. You are the God of this church. You are the God of all grace, the God of all love. You are the God of all power. You are the God of all righteousness. You are the God of all justice. You are the God of all miracle. You are the God who is creative. You are the God for whom nothing is impossible. You are the God who makes a straight way before your people. You're the Lord, the God above all gods of this earth. You're the God who is worthy of every knee bowing. So we lift you, Lord God of heaven and earth. Lord Jehovah God, we lift you on high this morning. Turning our hearts and our minds from the things of this earth to you in this moment. Lifted high in the heavens. But right here in this place with us this morning. We exalt you. We exalt you. next few moments, we're going to open up your eternal life-giving word, sharper than any two-edged sword. Would you give us ears to hear, Father, what your Spirit is saying to us in this hour? Would you give us eyes to see the activity of your Spirit at work around us? And Lord, may you open wide, fling open the doors of our heart in these next moments. To receive you and your truth, your light and your life into our hearts. We love you, Lord, and we're here for you. Amen and amen. friends there are times that it's that it's just right to be still in the presence of the Lord there's moments in the presence of the Lord that we pray and we verbalize our prayer there's 
moments in his presence that we verbalize our praise and our worship. There's times in our presence of the Lord that we declare his word, his truth, his promises that are in his word. We proclaim those in his presence out loud, reminding him of his promises. You say, oh, God doesn't need reminding. Well, he hasn't forgotten. But Moses sure was pretty good about reminding God about his promises, wasn't he? Wait a minute, God. You said you weren't going to kill all these folks in the desert. Ah, yeah, you're right. Not so much reminding God, but reassuring ourselves of that promise. And then there's times you just be still. Sometimes you'll hear me refer to my morning prayer time. I'll refer to it all different ways. It's always the same thing, and it's usually in the same one of two spots at my house. But sometimes I'll refer to it as my quiet time, meaning just a place to be still with the Lord. That's not always quiet because I've usually got Spotify playing some worship music, and I've got, you know, I'm quoting scriptures, and praying out loud and those kind of things. But it's just a, a be still moment with the Lord. since the Lord's with us this morning in this place I trust that you sense that as well I trust that you know he's, he's here he's right here and I don't know what all else he wants to do I, I, we're going to have some special prayer at the close of the service for some very specific needs of some of our family members But just this awareness of his presence assures us that whatever he's getting ready to do and wants to do, it's all going to be good. It's all going to be right. It's all going to be him. Amen? Well, I appreciate you opening your hearts to the Lord this morning in worship. We remain in an attitude this morning of that worship and that seeking the Lord as we get into the study of his word in a moment. But let me invite you, if you're already seated, go ahead and stand if you would. And before you are seated, I'd like to ask you to turn around, step up and down the aisles, give some hand, folks a, a handshake or a knuckle punch, and just give them a greeting today in the house of the Lord. Would you guys let our worship team know that you appreciate them and our media team, worship team, vocalists, the uh, media team upstairs. These folks get here bright and early 
every Sunday morning. Some of them even come in on the weekday and get stuff set in order so that we can have every opportunity to make room for Jesus. And that is, I will remind you what we have committed ourselves to here. So if you're newer to Victory Family Church, maybe even you're a guest with us today, and you think, man, why did it get so quiet all of a sudden and this, that? We've just decided about seven or eight months ago, we were going to let make room for Jesus. We were just not going to try to move too fast through certain parts of a service and just let the Lord uh, do what he wants to do and, and see. You know, I, I prayed that prayer at the close of our worship and was getting ready to transition us, and there was just this sweet stillness in the auditorium. So I thought, well, let's just wait. Some folks are getting blessed in some special ways. Let's see what the Lord wants to do. And uh, we do believe in the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and there are some times that uh, the Holy Spirit will speak a word or speak into or move someone uh, with a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or a prophetic word or something of that nature, the gifts of the Spirit. And so we always, we make room for that. So I thought, well, I don't know, maybe there's somebody, he doesn't always tell me what he's up to. <laughs> I always ask him to, but uh, sometimes he just says, you just stay out of the way, try to do your best, Mark, to stay out of the way and let me do what I need to do. So if you are a guest with us, thank you for being with us today at Victory Family Church. We're honored you're here today. If you're online through one of our venues, thank you for tuning in. And I just remembered that they say TV adds 10 pounds, so I'm really not that fat. And uh, thank you for being with us today. If you're a guest in-house, we would invite you, if you'll take a moment, there's a little welcome card in the book pocket of the seat in front of you this morning. And we would invite you, if you would, take just a moment and uh, sometime between now and the close of the service, and uh, fill out the little bit of information that it asks for there. It is a record of your attendance with us today at Victory Family Church. Uh, we will not harass you or, or bother you or try to sell you a car warranty or anything else. We will uh, respect you and, and your desires, but also on the back of that card, you could indicate if you would like some more information about the ministries of Victory Family Church, and we'd be glad to uh, share that with you. But we are honored that you're here in the house with us today, and thank you so much for choosing on this rainy Sunday to come out and be with us. And I'm so grateful for the rain. I told the worship team earlier this morning in our pre-service meeting that three weeks ago, I put quite a bit of seed, forage seed, out in my little pasture so uh, Jack would have some stuff to eat when we bring him out to the house and expecting rain that next day and nothing. Three weeks, it's been bone dry. So then I'm watching the forecast for this coming week. I'm thinking, I, put, I have put five acres worth of forage on two acres of land. And I'm so glad the rain came last night. And it looks like hopefully it's going to stay around for a while. But uh, very grateful. Some of you might not like the rain, but I am thankful for rain today. There have been times, maybe not so much, but today, amen and amen. But thank you for coming out in the rain. Notice none of you melted, so it's all good, right? Take your Bibles with me, if you would, and turn to Mark chapter 14. We are continuing a study through the gospel of Mark. We began this study back in June of 2021, and we have taken breaks in between. It's not like we've been preaching for 900 days through the gospel of Mark, but this is part number 64, if that helps you out any. But we have taken breaks on other series and things, but I do want to complete this study as a as a, as a studier and a student and teacher of God's Word, I don't want to just leave us hanging before we move in. We will, I believe, Lord willing, we will move into a study uh, through the book of Acts. We will be studying verse by verse through the book of Acts uh, at some point this year after we finish Mark and maybe another series or two in between there. But we've been studying through the Gospel of Mark with the sole purpose of wanting to know more about Jesus, but even more importantly, wanting to know Jesus more in our personal relationship to him, who he is, what he said, what he did, what he does, with an anticipation that he is that Jesus living in us. We are at the point where Jesus is just a few hours away from being arrested and being taken to trial and then crucified for the sin of the world. So we are near the end of the earthly life of Jesus. And we find ourselves in the Garden of Gethsemane this morning. Jesus has already celebrated the Last Supper, Passover. He instituted communion then, the ordinance that we follow as the New Testament churches today. Uh, 
He has already told uh, the disciples that they're all going to flee from him and run from him. He's told Peter, Peter says, I will never flee from you, though all of these others flee, I will die with you. And Jesus says, no, before the rooster crows two times in the morning, you're going to have already denied me. Peter says, not. Nah, it'll never happen. Jesus takes them out of the city of Jerusalem over through the Kidron Valley up to what is called the, the Mount of Olives, near the, near the base of the Mount of Olives, to what is called the Garden of Gethsemane. Everybody say Gethsemane. Gethsemane means olive press or press of the olives. So it's on the Mount of Olives. It is a personal piece of property owned by an individual who it's believed to be a friend of, of Jesus, an acquaintance at least of Jesus. The disciples are known to go there with Jesus quite often. So Next week when we look and we see that Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss on the cheek, remember he leads the guards and the religious leaders into finding Jesus. Judas knew exactly where Jesus would be. He would be in that garden praying. So Gethsemane means olive press. And, and I don't know a whole lot about how to make olive oil, but I, but I do know you have, to crush the, you have to crush the olives to get the juice, right? If you're going to get juice, you've got to crush and so the olive press would, would, would crush the, the olives so that the juice would come out. Then they could take the oil and they could make medicine from it. They could use it for cooking. Uh, they would use it to make anointing oil. When you go back in the Old Testament and Moses is given commands on how to prepare the anointing oil, you find that uh, it is made as a base with olive oil and then many other uh, spices and, and uh, ingredients added to that. But this idea of an olive press pressing is very uh, very illustrative, I think you could say, of what Jesus is experiencing in that garden. We're going to see Jesus calling out to the Father. We're going to hear in the words of Jesus and in the expressions of Jesus, and even according to Dr. Luke in his uh, recounting of the Garden of Gethsemane, the Jesus praying so intently that the sweat of his brow became like blood. And we're going to see this physical agony that Jesus is in, this soul agony that Jesus is in. And it's very fitting that it's in the olive press because the anointed one, the Messiah, is beginning to be pressed, beginning to be crushed. I remember the prophet Isaiah would say he was bruised for our iniquities. He was pierced for our transgressions. This is the beginning of that process of his pressing. I believe this morning this is a timely word. We're going verse by verse, chapter by chapter. But I believe it's a timely word for us in our hour right now. It's a timely word about prayer, preparing, and prevailing in prayer. We're going to see the, the agony in this, this, this warfare that Jesus is fighting in the garden. But what I want us to, to follow is the importance of his prayer and his, his posture of prayer. Let's put it that way. So Mark chapter 14, let's begin reading in verse number 32. And they went to a place, this is Jesus and the 11 disciples. Judas left earlier and went to go find all of these other guys that are going to come arrest Jesus. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I say it with me, pray. Now, don't, let's don't move too fast past that right there for a moment. While I pray. I want to remind you that Jesus prayed a lot. Throughout the four Gospels, over and over again, we find Jesus in some posture of prayer. We find that uh, there were occasions, we're told in the Gospels, that he got up early in the morning while it was still dark and went out to pray. We're told there are times, there was a time at least that we know he prayed all night long, and that was when he was praying before he selected the 12 disciples that would be his first followers. We find that he prayed early in the morning. He prayed at his baptism when he was baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. Uh, he prayed after a long day of ministry. We could look and we follow through that 
uh, in, as we studied earlier in Mark, he had this really long day. In fact, there was so much ministry taking place through Mark 6 that it took us a few weeks to get through studying verse by verse through Mark 6. So after these long days of, of ministry, he still goes and finds a solitude place to pray. He took the disciples, James, John, and Peter, up to the mountaintop, what we call the mountain of transfiguration. He went there to pray and the glory of God came down on top of that mountain. Those are just a few examples, but I would present to you this morning, Jesus, the Son of God, prayed. And if Jesus, who is God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, if he was called to pray, and if he found it necessary to pray and make time to get into the presence of his heavenly Father, then I would present to you this morning, we could do nothing less. In fact, since we aren't God in flesh, (laughs) maybe we should pray more than Jesus prayed. Now, that's a high call. It's a high calling. The power of Jesus while he was on this earth, housed in a human body of flesh, I believe, was his discipline of prayer, staying in the presence of the Father, connected to the Father. So let's pick up in verse number 33. And he took with him, so he brings all the leaven in, and then he takes Peter, James, and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to those three, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. So he brings the three out. He leaves the, the other eight at the front gate area of the, of the Gethsemane. He leaves them there maybe to, to watch or to kind of, I don't know, but he leaves them there, takes Peter, James, and John a little further into the garden, and then he says, you stay here and watch. And by the way, Luke tells us he commanded them not only watch but also be praying. Jesus goes on a little further by himself, and going a little further, he fell on the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. The hour is a reference to God's timing. This is the appointed time. Jesus understands this is the appointed time for the fulfillment of this eternal plan that God has always had in motion to redeem people from sin. This is the hour, that appointed time. As I told you, Luke says that he pray, He told the disciples to not only watch, but also to pray. Let's go back in verse number 33 for a moment. That word distressed, everybody say distressed. It has several different, in its original Greek, it can be defined in several different fashions, but one of those is, means to be astonished. So it could be read as he began to be greatly astonished. Now, astonishment, we think of, woo, like a, like a surprise birthday party or something that, you know, the, the awe of that or the astonishment of, of that or the astonishment of finding a dollar bill stuck down in a pair of pant pockets that you haven't worn in several months and you feel like you hit the jackpot, right? Astonishment. We think of that. But think of it this way, in line with this idea of distressed and astonished, astonished to the point of distress. Now, what, and let me just ask you this question, what would, what would astonish God? He knows all. He has seen all. Let me ask you it this way. Is there anything God would be astonished by because he hasn't experienced it? I would present to you there is one. He's never experienced death. God is eternal. He always has been. And he always will be. In fact, do you understand that when he put on a human body and came to this earth, it was for the sole purpose of being able to experience death for us. So Jesus in this moment is dealing with this understanding that for the first time, he's going to experience death, separation from God the Father. 
He's going to experience sin, though not his own. He's going to experience sin for the first time as your sin and my sin is placed upon him on that cross. At which point the father says, I have to turn my face from that. And for the first time, God is going to experience his own wrath because of sin that's placed on the Son of God. You tracking with me? Jesus is astonished. He's distressed. He is overwhelmed. None of us like, well, we all like surprises maybe, but we, we don't like them a whole lot. And Jesus is about to experience something he's never known. He has seen it during these 33 years on this earth. He has seen what sin does to people. He has seen judgment. He has seen death, but he hasn't experienced it. So for the first time, he realizes this is somewhat overwhelming. The reality of the hour, I believe, now sets heavy on Jesus. Pick up in verse number 36. And he said, Abba, Father, this is him praying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Now, that sounds awfully bold, doesn't it? You ever found yourself telling God to do something? Once you realize what just came out of your mouth, it's a little scary, isn't it? Better get your lightning rod up because <laughs> that may not be what he wanted. But notice what Jesus says. Oh, keep, keep in mind this. Remove this cup from it, yet not what I will, but what you will. What he's still saying is, Lord, remove the cup from me, but you do what you're going to do. Verse 37. And he came and he found them, the three, sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon. Notice he goes, he calls him Simon. Remember, he started calling him Peter. He went back to Peter's old name, Simon, because Peter's acting a whole lot like he used to when he was Simon. Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, remember, Peter is that fellow that just several minutes earlier before this on the way over to Garden of Gethsemane says, Jesus, though these guys might deny you, I will never deny you. I will die for you. And Jesus says, Peter, pray and watch so that you don't fall into temptation. See, there's Peter's answer. Remember I told you last week the one thing Peter didn't do was stop and ask Jesus what he could do to make sure he didn't fail him? This is what he needs to do. Jesus is telling him, Peter, if you don't want to fail, watch him pray. The spirit indeed is willing, but flesh is weak. And again, Jesus went away and he prayed, saying in the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. In other words, there was no excuse. That's basically what that means. There's no excuse for their not praying. We tend to find a lot of excuses. Did I just say that out loud? Verse 41, and he went back to pray, and he came a third time, and he said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Is it enough? The hour has come. In other words, is this all you can do in the middle of this God-appointed moment? The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This morning, I want us to look at a couple of things about prayer as we see modeled by Jesus. One, uh, one uh, commentary that I was reading this week in preparation for this teaching referred to this as the Lord's Prayer. And then he said, and I would consider that what we call the Lord's Prayer would actually be the disciples' prayer. Remember, Jesus prayed so much, and they saw Jesus praying, and they associated his power with this prayer. And they said, teach us how to pray. So he said, when you pray, here's how you pray. Here we see Jesus praying. And, and if you want further to understand 
So Jesus, for an hour, is not just saying, Lord, let this cup pass, Lord, let this cup pass, Lord, let this cup pass. That's the gist of and the essence of this prayer that he's praying. Most scholars believe that John chapter 17 gives us more insight into what Jesus is praying. He prays in John 17 for himself in relation to the Father, prays for these disciples who is leaving the kingdom into their hands, and he prays for you, and he prays for us. He says, those who believe the message of these apostles. So he prays for all of us. You can go back and read that and find encouragement in your hearts there. But I want to look at three reasons for just a brief moment this morning of why you must be a praying person. Praying like Jesus is the title of this teaching today. Number one, prayer produces spiritual awareness. Prayer produces spiritual awareness. Verse 41, Jesus knew this was the appointed time. Jesus has always known there would be the moment that for what he came, the purpose of dying for the sin of mankind, that that would come in at some moment. Now he realizes this is that moment. I present to you that he understands the moment because he's been in prayer for 33 years. He is familiar with being in the presence of the Lord and seeking the Lord hearing from the Father. Remember, he said, I only speak what the Father tells me to speak. That means he's got to be able to hear the Father. He says, I only do what the Father gives me to do. He's got to know what does the Father want him to do. So he's been discovering that as he's been on this earth for 33 years. He is so familiar with the presence of God and seeking God in prayer that when God is up to something, Jesus is quite aware of it. And this is the hour. The disciples, on the other hand, totally missed some very spiritual moments because they were unaware, because they were asleep. Jesus told them when they first get to the garden, my soul is overwhelmed even to the point of death. But the light doesn't go off for the disciples. Nobody reaches over to embrace Jesus, to encourage Jesus. In fact, they are so weak at helping Jesus in this moment that when it's all said and done, God has to send an angel to come down and minister to Jesus. That we read in Luke. God sent a ministering servant, an angel. So the disciples totally missed an opportunity to encourage Jesus to to be a part of this with him because they're asleep. Jesus tells them to watch and to pray. And in the most monumental moments of God in the history of mankind, that hour, they sleep. Spiritually unaware of the magnitude of what's happening in the spirit. Jesus, a man of prayer, is quite aware of what this moment is and where it's headed. I present to you that in prayer, as we make prayer our discipline and we make prayer a a part of our existence, that we begin to develop a spirit of discernment. We can discern, not in ourselves, but because we are in the presence of the God who knows all and sees all, who has put all the things into motion and has his timing for all things. And we can see and discern spiritual things in our moment, in our time. The prayerlessness of the disciples results in a cluelessness to what's going on spiritually. The three closest disciples to Jesus, Peter, James, and John, missed the most spiritual, pivotal moments in that garden with Jesus. For truly, spirit was willing. Jesus, I'll never deny you, but flesh is weak. (laughs) Missing the moment. You see, you and I, 
we are filled with the presence and spirit of Jesus, having been born again. We cultivate that relationship through prayer, through getting in the still, quiet place and learning to hear as he's speaking to us. And can I just tell you, he's speaking a whole lot more than we realize because we're not spending more time in prayer. And the more time in prayer, the more you hear. People say, I'll hear them say, man, I wish I was just as spiritual as so-and-so. I've heard people say, man, I wish I could hear God like Meemaw hears God. Well, can I tell you what? Meemaw just prays like a big mug. She's always praying. She's always got her word out. She has direct TV, but she doesn't know how to use it because she rarely watches TV. She just prays and she worships and she reads. You say, man, I wish I could do that. (laughs) You can. You can. You can. You just make it your life. You make that a part of your life. Well, then I won't have any social life. Man, you got church. You got church. But you see, we need in this hour, and I'm just going to say, this is the generation, the hour that I live in, that you live in, and I'm sure every generation has had their awareness of, of spiritual warfare. But it's hard for me to imagine that it could, be, could have been in history any more intense than it is now. The only thing that I thought... It could have been intense in every generation as it is right now. We maybe just be so affronted with it because of all of our access to media and social media, things of that nature. But, friends, we really are. We really are living in a time in which not only is God preparing for the return of his son Jesus, But just like Satan knew Jesus was coming, he knows he's coming again. He knows he's coming again. And we are experiencing an onslaught of demonic activity across our globe, around the world. But you see, we're we're seeing it as it's manifesting through people and politics and things of that nature, and so we just say, well, the world's just going to hell in a handbasket. But what's creating that is a spiritual warfare that's happening. Now, before you think I'm Looney Tunes, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil and having done all, to stand. Notice the posture to prevailing in spiritual warfare is not sleeping. A horse can sleep standing up. You, not so well. The posture of standing firm in warfare with the enemy is a posture of standing. Now, I don't talk about this this idea that there's this onslaught of demonic activity taking place in our generation at such high levels to put fear in you because we're told we are armored in Christ. We will not be overtaken if we stand. In Christ. If we sleep, we find ourselves in the position the disciples are in in the garden. Totally unaware, caught off guard, and unable to discern the activity in the hour or the moment. It is a time, church, for us to be a, a, a alert. Jesus says, watch. Watch. Keep watch. Look at what's happening. And prepare yourselves in that. Prayer gives us an awareness of the activity of the Spirit. You see, you may feel like 
your marriage problem is just the fact that your spouse is an absolute jerk. They probably don't want to be a jerk. And maybe jerk is your interpretation. But what is there that's at work that causes them to say or to do or to be what you find troubling and obnoxious? I present to you, there's an enemy who hates them. Who wants to see that they don't walk in the fullness of what God's kingdom has brought through his son? And there's probably some spiritual activity taking place that's creating how you're thinking. And if you've been sitting around the office talking about how bad everybody else's spouses are and hearing them griping and complaining, then that's all you're going to see. There's activity taking place. We've relegated that the place that we find our nation in right now, and I'm not trying to get political, but we've relegated it to politics and certain parties. And can I tell you that it's not about politics and it's not about parties? It's about a, it is about a, a plan that has been instituted in a scheme of the enemy to keep people from Christ and to keep the blessings of God, to separate people from the will and the purpose, presence, and blessing of God. So I present you, it's not about politics or politicians. There are things happening in the heavenlies that we cannot see with the eyes, but if we will be praying people, we will be aware that what we're hearing is not truth, that what we're seeing is not God's purpose. And we can see that and know that so that we can respond properly, first guarding ourselves from following that down into destruction. Prayer produces a spiritual awareness. It secondly produces a spiritual alignment. Jesus says, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but, but not my will. Jesus is bringing himself into alignment with what the will of the Father is. Now, let's be honest. Jesus is God in flesh. He is in a human body. When he goes to the cross, his hands will be nailed. There will be blood that comes from his hands and his wounds and all of those stripes on his body. He will bleed because he is in a human body. That means he will experience pain just like you experience pain. And I believe in this moment, Jesus is in a place of warfare and there's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. He told the disciples, look, spirit is willing, but flesh is weak. Jesus is spirit, but he's also spirit in a flesh body. Now, I'm not saying Jesus is weak because Jesus prevails through this. But there is this this agony of the flesh that just knows what this pain is going to be. There's this agony of his spirit knowing what this sin of the world placed on him is going to do. For the first time in all of his eternal existence, he will have the Father turn his face from him because of the sin that is placed upon him on the cross. But what Jesus wants is to fulfill the will of the Father. So he says, Lord, if there's another way, let this cup pass. The reality is Jesus knows there isn't another way. What he's doing is bringing himself into complete alignment so that he can stand up walk toward those guards and walk out into the fulfillment of what God's eternal redemptive purpose has always been. I present to you prayer 
is so, so much more than just asking God to meet our needs. He does that and he gives us permission to ask that. But more than anything, prayer is bringing me into alignment with what is God's will so that eventually I start learning, don't ask for that because this is the will of the Father. And you're bringing yourself into alignment. Sometimes I think a lot of prayer doesn't get the response that we anticipate and expect because we're praying this over here and this is where God wants us. And prayer is designed to leave it all in the hands of God and get familiar with his presence and his activity and his word and his promises so that I come into alignment. And I can say, Lord, let your will be done. And I can trust him. That's prayer. Prayer moves me to that place. You say, Pastor, I don't think I'm there yet. You probably aren't. I'm not fully there either. Not a one of us in the room is. That's why I pray some more because I want to get there. In this hour, I want to know the activity of God, and I want his will. I want his will. Thirdly, So it brings this awareness and this alignment. Prayer then produces spiritual authority. Now, we have been given, as we talked earlier in the service about the name of Jesus, we've been given this name, the authority of the name of Jesus, that as we walk and we live and we move and we have our existence, we have the name of Jesus as our authority. What authority do we have to pray for healing? Jesus has given us his name. What authority do we have to believe that we can tear down demonic strongholds in people's lives and in communities? The authority Jesus has given. He gives us spiritual authority, but if I don't spend time in his presence seeking him and knowing him and and being aware of his activity and, 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 and being alert and watching to what is happening in the places around me, then I don't understand his authority. And so I just follow along with what seems normal and natural. If everybody's griping about this, then that must be I'll gripe about that. If everybody's believing that this is the best, then then I'll just go with that. And God's saying all along, I've given you authority. He tells us in Matthew 16, Jesus says, I will build my church. He would build his church on that confession that Peter made. Remember, Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, Peter, that didn't come from you. The Holy Spirit revealed that to you. Peter, you're now the rock. And on this rock, but the word rock, when he says, Peter, you are the rock, and he says, on this rock I will, those are two different Greek words, two different meanings for rock. And what he's saying is on this rock, Peter, on that confession, I will build my church on those who can confess with a conviction from the inside that I am Christ, the Son of the living God. That's who Christians are. That's what the Christian church is. That's what this gathering here is today. We're a gathering of people who believe Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. So we worship him and we pray to him. And we open up his divinely inspired eternal word because we believe he is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what draws us together. We all went to different schools. We were all born at different times. We were all born in different cities. We all have different habits, hobbies, and everything else. But we have this one confession. We believe Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. So prayer, Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus knows that prayer brings an awareness of spiritual activity. It brings us into alignment with God's purposes and God's power. As we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, with with principalities and powers and authorities, you can't put on boxing gloves You can't pull out a switchblade or nunchucks and fight the devil. 
that is a place and a posture of prayer in which you demonstrate and declare the authority of Jesus. So Jesus would tell us in Matthew 16 that on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, the power and strength of all of hell cannot prevail against my church. Who's his church? What is his church? People who confess Jesus is the son of the living God, who have been given his name and his authority. And then Jesus would say, this church will bind, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's so much debate as to what all that means. I'm just going to tell you what I feel in my spirit. And that is, we have this authority. How did Jesus tell the disciples and us to pray? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done here as it is in heaven. I literally believe that the church has the authority in Jesus to declare what's permitted on this earth spiritually and what's prohibited. But it won't happen because I just want it to. Satan will give up no territory. Satan will give up no stronghold. Satan will not release any captive without a fight. And I present to you that in the garden, as was on the 40 days Jesus was in the wilderness at the start of his ministry, Satan appeared to him near the end of that and tempted him three times. Though we do not see a physical manifestation, and we don't even know if there was a physical manifestation of Jesus in the wilderness, we just know Jesus had conversation. I believe Satan is present in the Garden of Gethsemane. We don't see a physical manifestation, but the battle, the battle. Because you see, we talk about the fact that Satan thought he had destroyed the plan of God by putting Jesus on the cross. The problem is, I think he knew why Jesus came. What did the demons tell Jesus one time? He confronted some demons that were inside a person, and they say, we know who you are. What would you have to do with us? I think Satan's a part of this struggle Jesus is having because he wants to keep Jesus from the cross. He wants Jesus to cave to the flesh. So he's fighting him. He's fighting him. And he fights you and I to keep us from the fullness of what God has for us. So Jesus, Jesus prevails. Now, I will also present to you that Jesus didn't wait to start praying until he got to the garden and figured out, oh, wait, I'm about to die. I'm about to be separated from God. No, he's always been praying. Thus, in the greatest moment of his agony, he's praying. Don't wait. Don't wait till the tragedy strikes. Don't wait till the need gets unbearable. Just be a person of prayer. As Paul would say, we pray continually. There are are times, I have a place in my home where I have my quiet time every morning. There's two places, one indoor and one outdoor. And then there's just, I just pray. I just, I don't know how to explain it. It's not like I stop every time. And if I'm in the car and I feel like I need to pray about something, I keep my eyes open. I don't have that much faith, okay? (laughs) Maybe the Lord's working on that, but I keep my eyes open. But it's a discipline where we begin to recognize the Holy Spirit's prompting me to pray. And when I become a, a person of prayer, I start to recognize that a whole lot easier. Oh, that's not just my Taco Bell lunch coming back up. That's the Holy Spirit quickening me. 
becoming a person of prayer. Prayerlessness for the disciples resulted in them being unprepared and careless in a very monumental moment. In our hour, in our generation, with the increase of activity as it is, of demonic evil influence, and the deception that is taking place, the arguments concerning all of the issues of the day. It's all, it's all a part of the warfare. That as Jesus' day of return draws near, Satan's time of intensifying his deception and his lies to stop that or to keep more people. He knows he can't stop the return, but he can sure stop people from being ready for it and missing it. The disciples were about to step into a spiritual battle. They all said, Jesus, we will never deny you, but they turned around and did. The answer was, Jesus says, watch, be alert, and pray. Because they failed at that, they failed Jesus when it got intense. Jesus knew the time was coming, and he prepared. He prepared in prayer. Let me close with this. He said at one point, he said, are you still sleeping and taking rest? That word rest means to be exempt. What he's saying is, do you think you're exempting yourself from what's about to happen? And I think he would say to the church on the earth today, don't think you're going to be exempt from this onslaught of the enemy as my return is imminent. Pray and watch. So here's your application. We're going to pray, and then I want to pray for some folks here this morning. Let me, let me read you a passage here out of Ephesians real quick because I want you to see Paul understanding what Jesus is saying in the garden. Finally, Paul says, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the enemy. For we, and he's scheming huge right now. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, we read that already, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil and having done all to stand firm. Then he talks about the armory. We go down to verse 18, and Paul says, Praying, once you've got all the armor in place, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert, watch, with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Pray at all times with all kinds of prayers. The idea is, church, we need to be people of prayer. Not simply that we need to be, we have to be. We have to be people of prayer if we're going to be aware, if we're going to be aligned, and if we're going to walk with any sense of Christ's authority in this crazy darkness around us. It's going to require that I be a person of prayer. So here's your application, and we're going to pray. If you're not praying now, Make it a point to get along with Jesus. Start today and make it a regular part of your day. If you're praying but it's only semi-regular when the mood hits or when you think about it, then your application is up it to daily. Up it to praying daily. Make the time. And if you're praying daily, don't think you're exempt. Take it another 15 minutes in the presence of the Lord. Fight the flesh that says, I got to get up and go do this or go do that. Fight the flesh that says, because you got to do this later, you need extra sleep. No, give the 15 minutes. Go to bed earlier, get up earlier, whatever you got to do. But it's time to be people of prayer. Father, I thank you this morning And as you challenge our hearts, you, you do so with a full awareness, Father, of our need for you and an awareness of your presence and activity with us. 
that we may be discerning people in this generation. And as you would say, Lord, to the disciples in the garden, watch and pray. I believe that's what you're saying to us today. Now is the time to watch. Now is the time to pray. Father, I pray that this, your spirit will stir our hearts to become people of prayer. That we may be discerning. And that we may be walking in the power and privilege and authority of your name. That, Father, people around us who are being deceived, people who are being destroyed by the enemy's schemes and tactics, we could step into their presence. We could step into them and their situation. And in the authority of Jesus, we could bring them out into light, your light, and into your life. Make us people of prayer, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. And I told a couple of folks that uh, we were going to close the service this morning. And uh, I'm hoping Pastor Daniel gets word that we're done. But I want him to join us. I've asked Steve to come down and join us. But I felt earlier this week that we've got several folks dealing with uh, some pretty severe back and neck shoulder type of area issues. Pastor Daniel himself uh, has been told that the fix for his is surgery. Uh, we're, we're believing that, that there's another fix. Uh, but if you're here this morning and you're dealing with back and neck issues, debilitating even to the point of, of altering life for you, I want to invite you to come and, and join me right here at the altar. and We're going to we're going to pray. And as these would come, I'm going to ask some brothers and sisters in the Lord to come and stand with each one of them. And we're going to pray the prayer of faith this morning, and we're going to believe God to manifest his healing. So if you need prayer, you got a back issue, you got a uh, shoulder issue, a leg issue. Jason, I'm glad you made it. You were, you were watching me today, weren't you? I'm glad you made it. So y'all step up a little bit closer so others can come. So I want some folks. Here's Pastor Daniel. Mary, are you here to pray with or be prayed for? Okay. Either one? Well, if you need prayer, let's get right up here, girl. Okay? So let me have some folks come. I need two or three people with every person up here this morning. And if it's not too late, I mean, we're not shutting down the line. You can still come if you need, uh, you need prayer and you want to believe the Lord for that healing anointing this morning. Thank you, man. Let me have a couple of more that could come right over here with her and pray this morning. I'm going to anoint you with the oil. As James said, is any one of you sick? They should call the elders of the church. We're believing this morning. So if you're laying hands on them or if you're in the congregation, stretch your hands toward these right now. And with great faith and an understanding of the authority that Jesus has over sickness, disease, pain, influences of things that hinder the physical body, the Word of God says, by his wounds we are healed. That word healed means we are made whole by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that wholeness means that we are made whole, spirit, soul, and in our bodies. And the issue with the back and the issue with the neck and the shoulders are those are, those are parts of our physical strength. There is more strength. Now, I'm not a doctor and a scientist, so I'm going on a limb here. You can Google it later and correct me, but more of our lifting and our strength is needed in our upper body area, the back and the shoulder. What do they say? You're shouldering a weight. Why? Because you can carry, you're meant to carry at least, bags of feed or whatever. And you need that strength of your shoulders. So what happens is these physical things happening diminish our physical strength. But I believe by the blood of Jesus, we are made whole. I believe he wants to strengthen. He said, Paul said, that if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, he will quicken our mortal bodies. He will quicken. He will strengthen. He will revive even our mortal physical bodies. Though they are decaying, he will quicken. So let's pray. Church, stretch your hands toward these this morning. If you're at the altar and you can Raise that hand to the Lord this morning. Raise that hand to the Lord this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for the privilege of carrying the name of Jesus with us, for being given permission to declare the name of Jesus through us. 
Father, we thank you this morning that you are the Lord who is our healer. You gave yourself the name Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. It's not unlike you to heal, Father. It is like you. It is like you to manifest healing, Father. And I thank you this morning that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in each one of these right now than he that is in the world. And whether these physical things are happening because of a spiritual situation, because of a spiritual attack, or because we just picked something up wrong and now it's all wacky, Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, you would manifest that healing anointing, that, Lord, you will loosen muscles that have been stiffened. Father, you will heal nerves that have been damaged because of things being knocked out of place. We're speaking, Father, this morning, the divine chiropractor would put back into place right now this morning that which has been moved and and realigned into a wrong fashion that's creating pain, that's creating harm, that's creating weakness in the back of the shoulders, the hip area, and that in the name of Jesus, Father, you're loosening those muscles, you're loosening those nerves, you are loosening those vertebrae, you are stretching, you are expanding, you are moving and freeing today shoulders in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, just say it together, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. healing anointing right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, now, Remaining in a posture of prayer, just try to move something or something and see where see where the Lord's at. In the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus the Lord, our healer, in the name of Jesus. And let me just ask you right now, anybody feel anything loosening, anything? Don't want you to make anything up to make me feel good. But just ask it. Do you feel a loosening? Do you feel a... You feel something, Raj? What are you feeling? A lot of relief. A lot of relief? Where were you hurting? Lower back. Okay. Feel like it's loosening up some? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else feeling something loosening? Okay. Let's pray again. Father, we just thank you right now for the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. The bondage of these back issues and these shoulder issues bound in the name of Jesus. And we speak right now, Father, that the power, the power of your spirit for healing would be released into these bodies right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, there would be freedom. There would be mobility. There would be relieving of pain and there would be stretching and the ability of flexibility. It would be strength restored. Parts of the body that because of this ailment or stiffness would have atrophied, Father, we speak a loosening today. We speak a strengthening of those muscles in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Anybody able to have a little more movement or a little more looseness or freedom? I think he gave me clarity. Chill out. 
take take care of my temper a little bit. Okay, so you think the Lord's telling you this one's on you? It's huh? like you're gonna live with this one. Here. <laughs> All right, so you're going to do that? Uh, I'll say yes. Now you're a pretty fit guy already, well, but maybe I, it just means some extra stretches or something. I don't got to get rid of this guy. Okay, well, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. Anyone? You feel a warm sensation down your body? Do you, do you feel any sort of loosening in your back or... Okay, so she felt this warmth coming through, working its way down her back and, and through her lower body. So that's the presence. I've, so whether it's completely healed right now or not, that tells me he's, he's at work. And the Word of God says, he who began a good work in you, well, what? He will complete it, right? Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you for complete healing, Father, complete strength and renewal in her back and in her legs, Father. Healing those nerves, healing the sciatic, Father. Healing the, the lower back and the muscles, the shoulders and the spine, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so keep trusting, keep praying, keep checking, see what he's up to. And when you realize something is taking place, give him thanks for it. And then keep pressing in. Bless you, Jason. Thank you, Daniel, for coming in. All right. So we uh, want to dismiss this morning with our four pillars of faith as we do each week. A reminder to you that wherever you find yourself through this week, whatever is happening, whatever is going on, you got these four pillars that you can stand on. And you can always know these are three, four truths that you can rely upon this week. Let's say them together with faith. God is good. Jesus forgives. The Spirit empowers, and all things are possible. Yes, they are. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Well, God bless you this morning. Hey, in your handout, there's information there about Victory 101 coming up in a few weeks. Uh, if you're newer to Victory Family, we'd love to have you join us for Victory 101. Introduce ourselves to you, tell you a little bit more about Victory Family. God bless you. Have a great week. Be safe on the roads heading home.